Second Peter one. Second Peter one. Where we began a series last week, um, talking about growing, what it looks like to grow in our walk with Jesus. I said last week that the number one question that I was asked by you guys over the last six months was, am I growing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing so that I could be growing in my walk with Jesus? And so over the next couple of weeks, we're just going to look at what that means. Last week, we laid the foundation down of what it means um, to be centered on the gospel, what it looks like, because the gospel has changed our lives, the impact that that's had. Um, and so we looked at Romans 8 and just studied um, just that passage for a little bit. And that sermon is up online along with the notes. And so I would love for you to process through those as we go through this series so that you are growing in your walk with Jesus. And this morning, I want to look at our desire that we are intended or created, per se, to grow. I've never met a person who doesn't want to grow. This week, I found a um, video camera with some of old recordings of my kids when they were small. And there were some recordings of um, a bunch of kids that sang up here um, for Christmas. And they were so different five years ago or six years ago than they are today. And so there's pictures of Micah when he was like six months old and he's just lying on his changing station, right? And I'm like, hey, Micah, do you want to go back to those days? No. Do you want to be bigger? Absolutely. I want to be bigger. I want to grow bigger and I want to do all this stuff, right? Nobody ever said they don't want to grow. Nobody's ever said that they have no desire to grow in their in their wisdom or stature or um, in, in their knowledge or in their walk with Jesus, but we feel this tension, don't we? We feel this tension of we want to grow, but often in our lives we feel stuck. We feel apathetic. The poet um, Carl Sandburg said something that I think I resonate with, that there's an ego inside of me that wants to soar, but there's also a hippopotamus inside of me that wants to waddle in the mud. And most of the time, the hippopotamus seems to win. In the middle of this series, we want to help you address your desire to grow along with our frustrations that we haven't made much progress as we'd like to make. And I want to give you a word of caution. This series isn't just about spiritual growth. We're complex creatures. We're complicated. God made us humans with bodies and emotions and relationships and minds and souls. It's impossible for us to compartmentalize these things. If I'm stuck in one area, it's going to affect every other area. If we make progress in one, it's also going to affect the other areas of our lives. God cares about all of our life. And so my prayer as we do this series is that we would be able to see how the gospel applies to all of our lives, how the gospel applies to all of us. I've read many self-help books in my life, and I'm afraid most of them haven't helped at all. The label itself identifies the problem. We can't help ourselves. We need God to change us, and we need each other in that process. Change is possible. You don't have to stay the way you are, but only comes as we, lean, as we learn about the means that God has provided for us to change, and as we slowly and imperfectly place ourselves in paths of God's grace. And in those moments when we say, God, help, God promises to meet us there. The news, my friends, is good. You can grow in ways that you've never imagined. And you can help those around you grow as well. But you must first learn how to grow and then begin to practice the habits that will put us in the paths of God's grace so that you can grow. God made you to grow, but it's important for us to understand what growth is and the pathway that he's designed for that growth. The Gospel of Luke concludes the childhood days of Jesus with two statements that summarize his childhood days in Luke 2, verses 40 and verses 52, it says this. He said, Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature with favor with God and with favor with man. Luke reports that Jesus kept growing and growing in four areas of his life. Number one, he grew in wisdom. He grew in skill of living. He knew how to live his life. He grew in stature. There was physical growth. There was health. That was there. He grew in favor with God. He grew spiritually. He grew in favor with man. He grew socially. What's amazing about this is how ordinary, how familiar this is. Even Jesus, who's God in the flesh, he had to grow. 
Luke's words echo the story of the same thing that's said about Samuel in the Old Testament. Samuel grew to in favor and stature in favor with God and with man. And even though Jesus was unique, he was God, he still had to grow by the degrees that you and I have to grow. He had to grow physically. He learned a trade. He enjoyed food. He observed rhythms of work and rest. He attended social events like weddings and funerals. He learned how to pray. He learned how to relate to other people. He developed skills for life. He didn't live on a spiritual plane detached from reality at all, but grew as a person in a particular time, in a particular place, around a particular group of people. To be alive as a person means that you grow, not just spiritually, but in every dimension of our humanity. I don't know if you've forgotten this or if you need to be reminded this morning, but can I remind you that God cares about all of you? about your entire being. He cares more than you just showing up here on a Sunday morning and doing a religious ritual. God cares about your mind. He cares. He created you to be someone that thinks. And in creation, he's given you a task to be able to create culture. And listen, that requires our mental facilities. And although our mental facilities were destroyed by sin or uh, damaged by sin, God in Romans says that he renews our mind. God cares about your mind. God cares about your body. I'm amazed at how physical and sensory the Bible is. We're told about people eating, walking, sleeping, moving from one location to another location, fighting, having sex, and so much more, all physical things. Even Jesus, after he's raised from the dead, shows up in a body that can be touched, in a body that can eat, in a body where he spends time with relationship with other people. In eternity, Scripture says that we will have physical bodies, resurrected bodies on the new earth, not spirits that are just floating around everywhere. We're not souls trapped in a body. We're physical beings. God cares about what we do with our bodies. In Corinthians, Paul writes to the church and says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that your body is the sacred place of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know your body is where God himself resides? And so he ends that section. He says, so glorify God with your bodies. God cares about our bodies. But God also cares about our relationships. And Jesus modeled this for us. He enjoyed a network of friends and is frequently founding, founded visiting homes and healing sick or sharing meals with people, whether they were enemies or friends or um, just new acquaintances. Many of the New Testament letters, the, um, they outline in detail how we're supposed to live in various relationships, how we're supposed to relate to each other as a church body, how we're supposed to relate to those people outside who are skeptical about Jesus, how we're supposed to relate as friends and family. It talks about relationships. Jesus also cares about our work, which is a good thing, considering we'll spend about 60,000 hours of our lives doing work. And rather than just working to survive, our work fulfills God's mandate to Adam and Eve to fill and subdue the earth and to bring order out of chaos as a form of worship and love to Jesus. The gospel brings meaning to what we do with our everyday lives, even work that sometimes seem mundane, sometimes just seems we're just working to pay some bills because scripture says that whatever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord, not for men, knowing that from God you will receive an inheritance as your reward. Why? Because when you work, you are serving Jesus. God cares about our minds, about our bodies, about our relationships, about our work. We need what Tish Harrison Warren calls a liturgy of the ordinary, a sense of God's presence in our everyday, ordinary life. Paul writes in his letter to the Colossian church, he says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, that's what I'm interested in in this series. That's what I want us to see, that whether we eat or we drink, whatever we do, that our lives are about one thing, one thing only, and that's his glory, that we would reflect Jesus. So often... 
We think that the Christian life is just about forgiveness of our sins and we lose sight of God's plan to completely transform us, to be brand new creatures. We settle for an impoverished vision of growth in one or two areas of life when God's desire is to reign in every part of our lives. We believe that growth is up to us, forgetting that His Holy Spirit dwells in us to make us holy. We think that sanctification in lofty, abstract terms, neglecting to translate it into the rhythms of our daily life. It is the ongoing process of submitting all of our lives to Jesus, to see him saturate our entire life and world with his presence and with his power. It's a process of daily growing in our awareness of our need for Jesus, for the everyday stuff of our lives. It is walking with Jesus, being filled with Jesus, being led by Jesus in every place, in every way, in every moment of our lives. That's our prayer as we go through this series. And in, this, in our text this morning, it's a wonderful text that encourages us to grow in our faith. And in these few verses, Peter shares such incredible truth to encourage and challenge us. I want to give you three things from this text. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. First thing I want you to notice is that God has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness through knowing Christ and trusting in his all-sufficient promises. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness through knowing Christ and trusting in all of his promises. And that sounds like a wonderful statement. That sounds, that, that statement is great. We believe it, but... Sadly, many Christians find this to be a controversial statement. Too many Christians have tactfully acquiesced to the notion that our riches in Christ, including things like scripture and prayer and fellowship and the indwelling Holy Spirit and all the other spiritual resources that God has given us, are simply not adequate enough to meet people's needs. Look at verse 3. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. His divine power has given us everything we need for life. Now listen, life for me in this verse begins the moment we have given our lives to Jesus. At that moment, before that moment, we were dead in our sins. We did not need Jesus. We were under God's wrath. Dead men don't need a moral code to live by. They don't need help, helpful hints to live a happy life. They need life. And at the moment we come to Jesus, God imparts new life, eternal life, as a free gift through Jesus. Jesus, whose sacrificial death paid the penalty for all of the sins for those who believe in him. But this eternal life is not something that simply pertains to eternity or to heaven, but it's use, useful even now. It begins at the moment of trusting in Jesus and it continues all the way through eternity. The eternal life impacts in the most practical ways how we live a daily life now. Peter is asserting that God has granted to us everything we need to deal with life's problems, whether they're major or they're minor. His word tells us how to deal with suffering. His word tells us how to deal with death, whether that of our own or that of a loved one. It tells us how to work through relationship difficulties. It tells us how to manage our finances. It gives us instructions on how to handle our emotions. It tells us how to gain wisdom in every situation of our lives. His word is sufficient. Peter not only says that God has given us everything pertaining to life, but also everything pertaining to godliness. Godliness is bound up with eternal life. Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, you will grow in godliness or Christ-likeness. And while you will never be perfect in this life, there should be change that's happening in you because you follow Jesus. There should be evidence that you are a follower of Jesus. Peter goes on in chapter 2 to describe ungodly behavior of false teachers who profess to know Christ but deny him by their deeds. But how? You've got to ask, how does God give us everything pertaining to life and godliness? He says, Peter says it in verse 3, he says, he gives us everything by his divine power. In other words, we're not talking about some techniques or principles that you can find in a popular self-help book. 
Peter is talking about something that div- requires divine power. And not just divine power, but through the knowledge of Jesus who called us to his own glory and excellence. We come to Jesus when he calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And God's calling us by his own glory and his excellence means that he is drawing us so that he will open our eyes to see his majesty and his beauty. All of Jesus' earthly life was displayed, his, it was displaying his glory and his excellence. But friends, the cross is the supreme demonstration of the glory and the moral excellence of Jesus. Because it was at the cross that the sinless Son of God bore our shame, that the sky was darkened, that the earth quaked, the tombs were emptied, that the dead were raised. It was there that the Father's perfect love and His perfect justice were met and satisfied. It was at the cross that we see the glory of Jesus and the virtue of Jesus, Jesus who committed no sin, and Jesus who there was no deceit found in His mouth, and yet when He was being reviled, He did not talk back. When he, was being suff- when he was suffering, He did not threaten back, but He entrusted Himself to God. It is there we see the beauty and the glory and the majesty of Jesus. And we come to know Jesus when he opens our eyes to see his glory and excellence at the cross. And at that point, what's supposed to happen is that we're supposed to begin this lifelong quest or journey or desire to know him more deeply, to love him more intimately to live the way that he's called us to live. That growing personal knowledge of Jesus as our all in all supplies us with all that we need for life and godliness. But notice verse four, that all of God's resources are contained in his precious and magnificent promises. Verse four says this, by this, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature escaping the corruption that's in the world because of evil desire. See, when we come to Jesus by seeing his glory and moral perfection of Jesus who died for us, we inherit all of these precious and great promises. And these promises relate to salvation, things like forgiveness of our sins, acceptance before God, a personal relationship with God through Jesus, access to the Father through prayer, the certain hope of eternity in heaven, and so much more. But they also include promises of the Bible that relate practically to life and godliness. Promises that you can be victorious over sin. Promises that the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all the other things listed in Galatians, they can be in your life. Promises that He would give you wisdom, and strength to deal with trials, and that he can give you peace that passeth all understanding. All of these promises are for us who are followers of Jesus. Peter says that he gives us these things so that through them you may share in a divine nature. And listen, he's not just talking about a future possibility that one day you will look like Jesus. He's talking about even now today, that when God calls you to salvation, he imparts into you life eternal life. And part of the gift of eternal life includes Jesus coming to dwell in you through the Holy Spirit. Peter means that we share in the very life of God that his Holy Spirit lives inside of us so that we can live differently. And not only do we become partakers of a divine nature, but his promise also enables us, verse 4 says, to escape the corruption that's in the world because of evil desire. The moment that you and I were born again, The moment that you and I came to Jesus because God's Spirit dwells in us, we are set apart. We no longer have to be slaves to sin. We are set apart from the evil of this world unto God. We now belong to Jesus. We share in His nature, which includes moral excellence. Because of sin, the world is like a morally rotting garbage dump. People in the world live for their lust, whether it's sex or greed or pride. But God's promise delivers us from that corruption. Already, if you are a follower of Jesus today, you have been set apart from the world to God through his life within you. And when Jesus returns, you will be totally free from sin. But in the meanwhile, 
We have to fight against the lust that wage against the war, lust that wage against our souls. And friends, it's a constant battle. It's a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute battle for a lot of us. It's a battle that we can win because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. God's power has imparted new life to you and I, and it's available to give us victory over the things of this world. Peter's whole point in this text is that God has graciously given us everything that we need for life and godliness through knowing Jesus and trusting in his wonderful promises. Listen, friends, if you are being constantly defeated by sin, if you are constantly losing your battle to sin, and I say it's because you don't trust the promises of Jesus. It's because you doubt that Jesus is able to help you. Because you believe that your sin is more satisfying than the promises of Jesus. Quite simply, it's right there. It's not because you're struggling. It's because you don't trust Jesus enough. You don't believe his promise is enough. You don't believe that what he said for you is enough. If you're struggling with pornography or sexual addiction, it's because you don't believe that Jesus can satisfy you and give you someone that could satisfy you forever. It's because you don't trust Jesus enough. And what you don't need is simply steps to break out of an addiction. That's needed. But what you need more is to see the promises of Jesus so that you will fall in love with Jesus and pursue Jesus so that your love for Jesus will become greater for your love for the things of this world. We need to love Jesus more. His promises is that he will give you unlimited resources in Jesus. And that leads us to verses 5 through verse 7 where we discover a second truth. Because God has imparted new life and spiritual riches to us in Jesus, you and I, we need to be diligent to grow in godliness. We need to be diligent to grow in godliness. Verse 5, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Notice what Peter says here. A couple things. Number one, to grow in godliness, you have to make sure that you have trusted Jesus and his promises. You have to make sure you've trusted Jesus and his promises. You know, just coming back from this mission trip, it's one of the things that pondered my life is like, it's amazing that people just don't flock to Jesus. Why don't they run to him knowing that all that he offers, all that he gives, why don't people just turn to him? He offers complete forgiveness of their sins. Eternal life is a free gift to everyone who would believe. What could be better than that? Why aren't people lining up at the door of churches all over the world asking, what must I do to be saved? The answer, 2 Corinthians, Paul says, is the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so that they would not see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus, who is the image of God. To use another biblical analogy, before God imparted new life to you and I, we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. If you this morning are a follower of Jesus, it is not because of your keen insight or your brilliant powers or logic or you just happen to find Jesus. It was because God has mercifully opened your blind eyes so that you can know him. It is the only reason you are here. The point is you cannot grow as a Christian until you have received new life from God through faith in Jesus. It is the life of Christ in you that gives you the motivation and the power to change and to grow. The instant you trust in Jesus, God graciously gives you the key to the unfathomable riches of Christ which supplies you with everything you need for life and godliness. You need to know that you've trusted in Jesus. Second, you need to maintain the right relation, motivation. You need to maintain the right motivation. Right motivation in the Christian life is essential. Is essential. It's easy to have a good motivation but the wrong motivation. Maybe, for example, you want to grow as a Christian because you think that, oh, everyone will look at me and say, what a great Christian he is. That's the wrong motivation. Or maybe you want to grow as a Christian so you'll become successful in your family and business, that you'll do these things so that God could bless you so that you could prosper in life. That, that may be better than pride, but it's still wrong because all you're doing is you're focusing on yourself. 
It is a great desire for God to bless your life, your family, your business. But the motivation that the, behind that desire should be, God, I want your blessings in my life so that I would bring glory to your name. That's right motivation. God, you set your love on me. You saved me when I was in the gutter of sin. You called me out of darkness into your marvelous night. Now, God, I want to grow in godliness so that my life proclaims your excellencies. In other words, God's grace was shown to us in Jesus is the right motivation for applying diligence to grow spiritually. So here Peter is telling us to grow in godliness. It's going to require diligence. It's going to require hard work. But when you do that, keep in mind the glorious truth that God has imparted new life to you in Jesus and that he has given you his precious and marvelous promises to equip you for life and godliness. That's the right motivation. Third, to grow in godliness, you need to be diligent. Verse 5 is better translated, applying all diligence. The idea is God has given you his life and all of his promises. Now, be diligent as you grow. Some people say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to let go and let God. Or, on the flip side, God did his bit. Now, I have to do everything on my own. Listen, neither one of those are accurate. Because God has powerfully worked in you. Because God has powerfully resurrected your dead bodies, now you must make every effort. Both of those are true. Paul says in first in Philippians, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in you, both to will and work his good pleasure. In other words, spiritual growth involves God's resources as the foundation, but our responsible effort in addition. Can I ask you, are you applying diligence to grow in Jesus? Do you give mental effort to grow in Jesus? Do you take time to grow spiritually? Do you hope that one day when there's time um, in the day, if you have time, you will sit with Jesus? Someone told me a long time ago, if it's important to you, you block it off. You make sure it happens. Does your life, your relationship with Jesus revolve around when you can squeeze him in? Or does the rest of your life revolve around your time with Jesus. What's of importance to you? If your walk with Jesus is important, you make time for that. And if you can't find time for Jesus, you're doing too much. And you need to figure out what you need to cut because there is nothing more important in your walk, in your life than your walk with Jesus. You can be a successful billionaire, but at the end of the day, when the waves hit and the storms come, it'll all collapse. You could be poor as dirt, but if you have Jesus, it doesn't matter what comes against you, you will be able to stand because you know that Jesus might be all you have, but Jesus is all you need. Build your life around Jesus. But what does that growth entail? Verse in verses 6 and 7, fourth thing that Peter says is to grow in godliness, you have to make progress in seven areas. Faith is the foundation. And to faith, we have to apply goodness and knowledge and self-control and endurance and godliness and brotherly affection and love. I don't think Peter wrote these as just a random list, but each of these things build on the other. Faith is the bedrock foundation. Without faith, we're not followers of Jesus. And the second thing is, the first thing that's built on faith is goodness. Because without that, we can't have a clear conscience. If we live in knowing disobedience to Jesus, he will not reveal spiritual truth to us. And thus, goodness precedes knowledge. Knowledge follows closely because we must know God's word to inform our conscience and guide us in our thinking and our behavior. But knowing the truth doesn't help if we don't exercise self-control. We need self-control to practice the truth. And so self-control is next. But self-control here and there, just on a few moments of your life, is not good enough. So we need endurance. 
endurance when trials and temptations come. And as we endure, Scripture says here, it produces godliness, which refers to living in reverence for Jesus in every area of your life. But true godliness is not just a private matter between you and God. It manifests in godly relationships, and therefore you need brotherly affection and you need love. Friends, spiritual growth is a long process. It's not a quick fix. It's like a diet or an exercise program, neither of which I am familiar with. It only shows results when you practice it consistently and stick with it during for the long haul. If you're not making much progress in your spiritual life, then you're not well established. One more thing I want you to see. In verses 8 through 11, Peter tells us the benefits of growing in godliness are four things. It's fruitfulness, assurance, perseverance, and eternal blessings. So the first two verses, 3 and 4, Peter sets before us the resources that God has given to us pertaining to life and godliness by knowing Jesus and the precious and magnificent promises that he gives us. In the next couple of verses, 5 through 7, he shows us our responsibilities to grow in godliness, summarizing the seven qualities that we talked about that are added to faith. And now in these last three verses, he shows the results or the benefits of growing in godliness. And this should be a motivation for you to hang in there. That it would be, it's a motivation for you to keep persevering where it would be so much easier for you just to go with the flow and just try to squeeze God in. This should be a motivation to say, no, God should be of most importance. He says, you will have the satisfaction of knowing that your lives are fruitful in light of eternity. That you will enjoy the assurance of knowing that God is calling you and chosen you as one of his own. That you will not fall away from the faith and that when we step into eternity, there's going to be an incredible welcome for you. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. The person who lacks these things is blind. He's short-sighted. He's forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and, eff and eff election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly supplied to you. Notice Peter saying, these qualities, faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, love, if they're growing in you, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to produce fruitfulness in your life. Friends, there's a direct correlation, a direct link between growth and godliness and fruitfulness in your life. Peter states this negatively in this passage. He says, notice what happens if you don't grow in godliness, you will live a useless, unfruitful life. Listen, some of you guys are in college. No one in their 20s woke up one day and said, I'm just going to waste the rest of my life. Now, if you did, talk to me afterward. No one woke up and said, I'm going to write out a plan for how to waste my life. No one said, hey, you know what? I'm just going to spend the rest of my life downloading apps and playing video games and binging on Netflix and surfing the net all the time, even if I never graduate or get a job or have a successful career because I know I can live in my parents' basement for the rest of my life. No one's ever said that, at least not to my knowledge. No one's ever said, I want to grow up one day to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, that I plan to live so selfishly and such disregard for others that I'm going to shred every relationship that I have. And also, no one ever said, as far as I know, that I'm going to spend as much as I can, get into as much debt as I can, so that I can spend the rest of my life paying off interest. No one plans to be useless and fruit, fruit, unfruitful. And yet, many, many people end up that way. If you're not diligent, if you're not pursuing growth in Jesus, and if that growth in Jesus is not transforming all of your lives, one day you'll look and you'll say, I've lived a useless, unfruitful life. But to put it positively, Peter says, how can I be useful and how can I be fruitful in my Christian life? How can I use the time, the gifts, the talents, the treasure that God has entrusted me so that one day when I stand before Jesus, I will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I can tell you as a pastor that it's very easy to be busy doing God's work but I don't want to just be busy. I want to be useful. I want to be fruitful. 
I don't want to just fill my days with stuff to do. I want my life to matter. I want my relationships to be better because I'm in there because I am so in love with Jesus. I want you guys to grow in your walk with Jesus because I'm in love with Jesus. I want my life to matter. In other words, if God has opened my eyes to the glory of the gospel of Jesus so that I know him, I want my life to show it. I want your life to show it. That you would be growing in the godly qualities that Peter lists and that you will be seeking to make your life useful and fruitful to the master who shed his blood to redeem you. If you're not living with that view, if you're not living with a view to how God can use you to bear fruit for his kingdom, and friends, you're wasting your life. If God is just an afterburner thought on Sunday morning, you're wasting your life. Listen, that doesn't mean that you need to be called into full-time ministry, but it means that in whatever situation you find yourself in, whether it's at home or at school or at work, wherever you are, that you would have the mindset that, God, you in your sovereign plan and purpose placed me here. Would you allow me to be fruitful? And would you allow me to be a blessing that my entire life, every second of every day that you give me matters and that when, I, when you are done with my life, you will take me home. But as long as I have breath, I want to be a blessing for your kingdom. That's the kind of life I want us to live. Friends, life is a vapor. Don't waste it living for selfish pursuits that will perish. Live so that you would grow in godliness, that you would be a clean vessel, useful for the master, prepared for every good work that he gives you. But notice there's a warning that Peter gives in verse 9. The person who lacks these things is blind, Peter says. He's short-sighted and has forgotten about the cleansing of his past sins. Peter's saying there's some people in the church. They experienced Jesus. They've encountered Jesus. They've been purified from their sins, but now they're slowly just drifting away. They're slowly just moving further and further away from Jesus. The literal translation is they were blind. They're short-sighted. These people are so focused on present life. They're so present on, they're so focused on what I can get most out of today for myself that they're not growing in the qualities that are mentioned in these verses. And they've become virtually blind to what Jesus has done for them in cleansing them from their sins. This forgetful and willful blindness due to their temporary focus on things other than Jesus has quenched their motivation to be diligent to grow in godliness and pursue Jesus. And so again, Peter brings us back to motivation. To grow in godliness requires applying all diligence because you don't grow effortlessly. Growth in godliness requires hard work and discipline over the long haul. What motivates you? The answer is that Jesus died for you. That motivates you. That he shed his blood on the cross to purify you from your sins. Remembering God's grace at the cross will motivate you to apply all diligence to keep growing and keep growing in godliness. Without keeping the cross in view, you will drift away into ungodly living and you will waste your life in light of eternity. And so the first benefit of growing in godliness is fruitfulness in the knowledge of our Jesus. The second benefit that Peter gives is in verse 10, he says, if you're diligent in growing in your walk with Jesus, you will have assurance of your salvation. You'll have an assurance of your salvation. Peter's saying is one way that you can be certain that you belong to Jesus is that you're growing in these qualities. Peter again is emphasizing that growth in godliness requires diligence. It doesn't happen without deliberate, concentrated effort. Listen, if you're cruising on spiritual autopilot, Take heed to Peter's exhortation to be more diligent, to make certain of God's calling and choosing you. The way you do that is to be diligent to grow in godliness. Growing in godliness is the direct result. It, growing in godliness results in the assurance of, God, in, of salvation. There's a lot of mistaken notions about assurance of salvation in our day. Some people say that if you said a sinner's prayer, you're eternally secure, and that you should never doubt that fact. But you, it doesn't need to show up in your life. But they overlook the clear biblical truth that new life in Jesus always manifests in a difference in how you live. 
in a life of godliness. And the problem is there are thousands of professing Christians who are now growing in godliness and they think that they're eternally secure. If you're here and you think that you, because you said a prayer that you're okay, but your life isn't showing evidence of Jesus, can I invite you to examine your heart? Verse 10, Peter says, Peter brings together two things that we often separate. He brings together God's sovereignty and calling and choosing us and our responsibility to be diligent in growing. In chronological order, God always comes first. That means we heard the gospel. God opened our eyes for, for, to our darkened understanding. He imparted new life to us when we believed in Jesus. And then after believing through his word, we come to understand that the reason God brought us to salvation is that he first chose us before the foundation of the earth. Our salvation is totally, completely from God. If he had not chosen us, if he had not called us, if he had not named us by name and said, this is my child, we would still be lost in our sins. How then do we gain the assurance that God has called and chosen us? First, have you heard the call to repent from your sins and believe in Jesus? Second, how do you know your repentance and faith are genuine? The answer is that God has changed your heart in such a way that what you used to desire, you no longer desire, but the things that you desire now are the things of Jesus so that you're growing in godliness so that you will know him better. You desire to please him. You desire to obey him. You desire to love him, to love the one who gave himself on the cross to rescue you from judgment. First John says it this way, by this we know that we have, that we have come to know him. Well, how? because we've kept his commandments. And friends, you take none of the credit for your salvation. You realize it is all due to God's sovereign grace in calling you and choosing you while you were still in your sins. So the benefits of being diligent to grow in godliness is you live a fruitful life and you have the assurance that God's called you and chose you to eternal life. And the third promise is that it results in the perseverance in the faith. Notice, the end of verse 10, it says, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. Friends, if you are cultivating these godly disciplines, if you are walking with Jesus, Jesus says you will not stumble. You will not fail. It will safeguard you from stumbling in the sense of falling away from the faith. The fourth thing, Verse 11, it results in eternal blessings. In this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. If you are diligent to grow in godliness, God will welcome you into eternal dwelling with him in heaven. This is not to say that salvation is by works, but rather that genuine salvation always results in a life that desires to follow, pursue Jesus. If you're not applying all diligence to growing in godliness, friends, you need to examine yourself. Maybe like those in verse 9, you have forgotten what Christ has done for you. And if that's you, would you confess and take steps to grow in godliness? But if you shrug off the cross, you're in a dangerous place. If the cross does not have meaning for you, you need to take heed. Peter is motivating us to be diligent, to grow in godliness by showing us the benefits. Looking back, see what God has done for us in Jesus. By his divine power, he has granted to us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. He has granted us precious and magnificent promises so that by them we can be partakers of his divine nature. We have the very life of Jesus in us and he has cleansed us from our sins. He took the initiative to choose us and call us to salvation. And in light of these great benefits, be diligent to grow in godliness. Be diligent in the present Growing in godliness will give us the joy of being useful and fruitful to God so that we don't waste our lives. It will give us assurance of our salvation. It will keep us from stumbling and falling away from Jesus. And yet in the future, the Lord will welcome us into his eternal kingdom where we will dwell with Jesus forever and he will tell us, well done, well done. In light of these great benefits, can I invite you, encourage you, be diligent in godliness. Be diligent 
in godliness. Friends, let's commit to growing, to discipling others and growing in spiritual maturity ourselves. These tasks lie at the heart of our mission as believers. We must grow. That's God's intent for each of us. You and I, we were made to grow. Not only that, but you can grow. God has given us means by which we can experience his grace and be transformed. Best of all, he hasn't left us alone. He has given us his spirit and each other so that we can grow. So friends, let's pursue growth. Let's pursue growth for ourselves. Let's pursue growth for our church. Let's pursue, grow. let's pursue growth for our community. This is what you were made for. This is what we were made for. Over the next several weeks, we're going to examine what growth looks like. It is so much more rich and more complex picture than what we can imagine. And then we're going to explore where to start, practical steps that we need to take. And we're going to finally, at the end of this series, we're going to look at how we can help others grow as well, because it's not just about us. But we need to make that effort to say, my walk with Jesus is more important than anything else. If it's important, then I'm going to schedule everything else around that. So I'm going to invite you guys to examine your heart, to examine your attitudes, your mind, your affections. As you come to the table this morning, as we go into communion, I'm going to invite you. Are you growing? Are you this morning on spiritual cruise control? Are you just saying, you know what? I'm just going to rely on the preacher to make sure I'm growing every week. Are you intentionally walking and growing with Jesus? Are you still in love with the Jesus you encountered the day he transformed your life? Does the cross still excite you? Does the cross still motivate you? We do communion every week here at Loft. We do this not because it's a great thing to do, but we do this every week to remind you that it, Jesus loves you, that he is with you, he will never abandon you or forsake you, and he desires to see growth and transformation in your life. We do this to remind you that it's not about you, that your life is so much bigger than you. And so as we come to communion this morning, I'm going to invite you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the one who is the author and the finisher of your faith, the one who says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Would you reflect on him? Would you rejoice in him? If the Holy Spirit is convicting you, would you repent to him? And would you come to the table this morning knowing you are loved, accepted, forgiven, part of his body? This morning, if you're here and you need